Oh, what's going on? You know, just sitting here on a nice 30 degree Celsius day in Melbourne, uh, talking to one of yeah. my teenage idols. What's up? <laughs> oh, wow. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for you, but uh, you could have uh, could have picked better. But uh, that's uh, that's one uh, one example of uh, how undeveloped we are when, when we're kids. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah yeah that's, a, that's good to hear it's been like minus 20 here you know for the past couple of months so um so i'm i'm really waiting to fly over it'll do me wonders you know from all this darkness and all that stuff to get some vitamin d in and uh you know to be able to let go for a wee bit i've been doing snow work for most of my days here so that's why you call a holiday in finland say <laughs> <laughs> so, um it's it's wild to me the differences between the two countries, honestly, and it kind of makes sense to me why you're such a uh, dark and brooding man musically. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's tough to say. Then again, you know, a lot of my some of my idols, you know, you think of uh, Nick Cave, for example, a good example of uh, coming from a sunny country. So, uh, uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, I think the the inner darkness is there in all cultures and in all areas of the world. We just. Uh, Maybe we're just uh, yeah, better prepared to uh, sort of work on that, work on those those emotions here. It's, it's a big part. We love emotional music and we love drama and we love the the sort of like, you know, mountain out of a molehill type of, type of thing regarding to arts and regarding to entertainment and all. We, we, we don't like happy-go-lucky music that much here. So, and uh, yeah, and I've always been wondering about metal here in in the nordic countries that uh if it has to do uh, you know if it has to do with the, with the cold weather you know we'll, all the guitar players and the drummers especially they need to keep warm so that's why they're doing blast beats you know to um to sort of like survive and that would be a good a good uh example of oh, not example but good um good way of interpreting all the church burnings as well it was out of necessity because people were cold <laughs> Not sure if that's true, but that's just a different angle, just uh, some food for thought. I mean, you, you you build something out of firewood, what do you expect to happen? <laughs> true that, true, true that, yeah. It's, it's a very complicated matter. And, and yes, I do. I'm pissed off that they destroyed such a beautiful part of, uh, you know, the architecture, especially in Norway. It was all those old churches that were really something beautiful. I've never been to one, but I've only seen the pictures and stuff. But uh, then again, we got some good music out of it, a couple of headlines. A couple of movies. <laughs> True, oh man, yeah, that's uh, the Jonas Orkeland one. That's a uh, that's a uh, that's a pretty a pretty heavy duty one because it's not. It, it is a sad tale at the end of the day. And then the same I, I met with um, Ishan from Emperor many many years ago, and uh, I, I kind of like didn't realize because they were all, the whole scene. You know, they were interpreted as being these dark, mysterious fellas, and I didn't think of the fact that they were just the same age as I was more or less and they were quite young when all that stuff happened so so basically they were just kids trying to find their way and uh find a way they did but what a dark and gloomy path it was you know dark and gloomy path is a pretty good ex uh, way to explain uh neon noir man uh <laughs> well you know that's that's one in interpretation of it you know i've sort of uh, i found it to be a very celebratory album in a, in a way that it celebrates the fact that shit does hit the fan there's nothing we can do to avoid it so why not celebrate it because also it's uh, it's one thing we have in common that we do fail and we do hurt and uh so in essence it's a very important part of who we are as uh, as human beings and and uh, and the one thing it, it, it doesn't matter what what you know god gods we pray to or uh, what political party we belong to we're all hurt at times and and uh so, so for me, it was a celebration of that. Maybe, of course, since throughout the pandemic, it was, um, it was. I think everybody was more or less searching for themselves and uh, trying to figure out what the hell are we really doing here, especially if there's no tomorrow. It's uh, one of those existential loops um, uh, that happened in, in a quite forceful way and in a global way as well. So, so I, you know, the music, music, music and the lyrics were, were my way out of that of that deep black hole that's uh, that's called COVID. so yeah it's a complicated matter i think but yeah you could call it a dark and haunting and whatever path you you know as long as, long as you call it something you know 
as opposed to nothing. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, as an artist, the last thing you want to do is make something that doesn't inspire or, or move people in any way. Uh, so the fact that people have those sorts of uh, emotional responses to something you're creating is an indication of you doing your job correctly. I guess it is, yeah. It's a, it's also something that you can't take for uh, for granted. It's not a given. It's it's not something that you can know that I'll pick this and this note or this and that riff and a fuzz pedal and it'll do this and that. And uh, so th that's the cool um, sort of Las Vegas aspect of uh, making music. You really never know where to place your bets and uh, usually just very close to your own heart because at the end of the day, you're the one who has to carry the responsibility of the music. The, the negative and the positive and uh, I don't want to end up being on the pearly gates and having to blame all my mishaps on record company people I'd rather blame them sort of, you know squarely on myself it feels more fair that way you know record company people they have terrible terrible burdens to carry anyway so they don't leave me on top of that <laughs> now uh, the record uh, is ostensibly the reason you're coming to Australia for the first time in far too long which is which is wonderful to hear I am curious, can, you're in kind of a transitional point yourself between like what was him and what is uh, the VV project. And and this tour kind of marks as an interesting uniting of those two things because you're uh, you're going to be playing some songs for the hymn songbook as well as playing songs from, uh, from the VV material. Uh, how do you differentiate which hymn songs to play and which ones are going to work in your solo set? Um, I, I thought it was pretty easy in a way that uh that there are songs um that you can't really leave out so starting from that sort of point of point of view i suppose what we should place like what we cannot skip um uh is we work it really well there, there are songs like right here moms or buried alive by love join me in death rip out the wings of a butterfly songs that are very essential not only to who what him was but uh but to who i am and uh, and that stuff works really well with the new material as well. It's not that far off. It's continuation on the same path, more or less, anyway. And uh, and the fact that I wrote wrote most of the hymn songs and uh, sang all of them um, does create a sense of familiarity. You know, there's there's not enough cigarettes I could smoke to uh, change that change that into something completely different. So uh, so um, but yeah. It's a. Uh, it's been cool because, as you said, it's it's been for myself as well. It's been a transitional moment, and and um, and and being in the past and the present at the same time is quite. I, I find it. I find it exhilarating. It's a. It's a celebration of 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 the fact that I was able to be in a band in the band him, and uh, we were able to tour around the world and spend twenty five years in the tour bus more or less and, and create some music that seems to still resonate with people so it's, it's a miraculous thing to have and to have that in my back pocket when when uh, working on new stuff is great so uh, so uh and I also i know that there's a lot of people who, who know me from him so it would be unfair not to play um uh him music a lot of people tend to when, when they start their solo careers or whatever they tend to sort of like denounce the past and uh claim that you know you know, dye their hair some, in some weird color or whatever. And uh, I think that that's just, it doesn't make sense in my case, you know? especially as I'm wearing a hat. You can't tell whether I have dyed my hair or not. I kind of miss the long hair, man. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it's still long. It's just an, uh, yeah. It's, uh, uh, the, the cool thing about this is, uh, is that uh, you're never having a bad hair day. Or then uh, the other interpretation is that you're always having a bad hair day. We don't have to think about it. Uh, I'm a, a man, man of practical matters. So, so the less I have to spend on my hair, the more I can spend on music. <laughs> I like that as a theory. I haven't cut my hair in like two and a half years, so I'm with you. <laughs> my man. <laughs> now, uh, an interesting thing about you as an artist is, is your voice, your actual instrument uh, is quite unique in the modern music world in the sense that not many people utilize elements of their range that you do uh, in, in your catalog. Most people steer away from the, the lower sort of vocal registers in, in modern music. And you kind of made a career out of that crooning kind of uh, style. Do you remember when you, um, when it was that you discovered that your voice sounded best applied in that way? Um, well, 
I think it was at, at the very moment when my testicles dropped. But uh, um, no, it's a. Uh, uh, I think voice is a miraculous instrument. I've always enjoyed singers who have very distinctive voices. It does the range isn't the number one thing, but uh, um, but but Perry Farrell, um, let me kill Mister. People that you can instantly, in one sentence, you can tell who it is. Ozzy Osbourne, and and I've always adored people like that. And then I also feel, as with music in general, that it can be, it doesn't have to be, but it can be playful, and you don't have to take yourself too seriously. I love King Diamond, and I I, I adored uh, Peter Steele, who had a very wide range as well. And um, and uh, but then again, I love Roy Orbison and uh, the sort of like Elvis, the crooners of the past, and uh, trying to incorporate all of that without without having to sort of censor myself in that sense. You know, I, it just makes all the sense in the world to me. And, and it's fun. A lot, a lot of singers in general are fairly generic. That's, that's always been the case. But usually, usually those are the ones that are not remembered. But then again, not everybody wants to be remembered. They just want to survive or they want to be on the top of the charts for a day. That's what they're looking for. There, there's way more entrepreneurs than, than artists these days in music and uh and uh there's not much i can do about it but uh, i can still complain you know from from minus 20 c in the middle of a snowy Finland. so you know that's uh, i'm showing my age <laughs> but uh yeah but, <laughs> but nah. no but it's a uh, it's, uh, yeah it's um yeah the voice is a miraculous thing and it's um, i've been blessed in fact that i haven't really lost it anyway and uh a lot, a lot of times in rock bands, you know, back in the day, because we didn't have in-ears, which everybody's wearing, um, you had wedges, monitor wedges on stage. So it was very hard to hear if you were in a loud band and singing low, because you're not pushing as much air out when you're singing in, in a very low baritone. So that, it's not the easiest thing to do. That, that's probably one of the reasons. But mo more importantly, I think that the fact that everybody's wearing in-ears and the fact that a lot of people are recording at their homes is the reason why all the female artists, or well, not all, but a lot of female artists especially sing very quietly because they have neighbors. They can't really belt out. And, and, uh, and some rock music as well. You know, back in the day, uh, rock bands always rehearse. You know, you had to try to sing as loud as you could because of, uh, you know, your PA. You wanted to be heard, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, sort of like amongst the fuzzy wall of noise of the guitars and bass and, and so forth. So um, there's, once again, practicality comes to it. So... Uh, Whatever sense that makes, I'm not sure. No, it, it makes sense to me. Uh, as someone who lives in an apartment who can't uh, who can't belt out frequently, that that explanation does uh, <laughs> does make sense. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it is very close to so like similar level of intellect as as uh, as the uh, my explanation is that uh, that the burning of churches for uh, for heating <laughs> reasons. So, uh, but you know, it's good to have these sort of like wacky conspiracy theorists. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. It is. It is great to have them. Uh, now you have sort of made a career out of being uh, everyone's uh, dark gothic prince. I'm going to call you uh, <laughs> uh, everyone, and uh, the favorite of many, many uh, gothic teenage girls I grew up around. Um, I'm. Have you found it hard to occupy that sort of space at all um, in terms of uh, your general? life getting around with people thinking that you're always going to be this like darkly romantic uh vampiric type <laughs> well that's more or less who i am so it's i never but never put on a mask or or uh, i'm uh, playing a role when being being uh, who i am or performing or whatever that's the that's the cool thing about uh, the possibility about um being a band such as him for example you know but uh no, I, I think when I was younger, it was a bit weird. But then again, at the end of the day, um, the visual appearance and, and all the non-music related stuff is very essential to rock. You know, all the legends about Led Zeppelin or whomever, you know, to, to, to have stories and, and weird theories um, uh, uh, about yourself, you know, weird rumors around. That's always a good sign. That, that means that you've somehow uh you know not necessarily made your point across but uh at least uh you know uh, annoying is a, is a to annoy people is a, is a talent as well and to annoy people to to an extent that they actually choose to put on all caps is uh is a uh, mission accomplished 
you put on our cap, they're putting on all caps. Uh... Sure. <laughs> cap is cap is a cap. How long is a piece of string? <laughs> well, uh, one thing that does unify the two sides of your career, of course, is the Hardogram logo, which everybody in the world, more or less, uh, recognizes at this point. Uh, did you ever think that it was going to catch on in the way that it has? And does it surprise you to see people today still getting around with, uh, with it tattooed on their body, for example? Oh, it, it still surprises me now in, a, in the most positive sense. I think um, uh, uh, for obvious reasons, I thought they was great when I came up with the idea, um, but uh, I never knew if it's going to take on or if, if people will, will sort of like understand the, the yin and yang nature. And Because you, you have to appreciate Vincent Price and you have to appreciate Madonna. Um, and uh, it's all about the beauty and the beast for me. And, um, and which one is which? I'm... I'm not at liberty to say, but uh, uh, the uh, yeah, it, it's traveled incredibly well. But, but, but as as a lot of people who know about the symbol know, it's not due to my talent or or my expertise in in branding. It's a uh, it's a lot of lucky accidents with uh, with me just by accident meeting uh, Bam Margera and him him loving what we do as a band and then directing videos for us and uh, singing our praise and and tattooing the symbol and it, it's been quite incredible that way and then there's a there's a few uh, hip-hop artists these days they're they're having that using using the symbol as well without my approval by the by the way but uh, uh, uh i think that they they learned about the symbol through bam so it's, it's funny how symbols can travel and how they can change meanings along the way and and uh, and uh, yeah it's a, it, it's an inc incredible thing for uh i think yeah i think i drew it down when i on the day i turned 20 just noodling and came up with the idea and it's yeah, I'm, I'm, I think that's the best thing. Everybody should come up with a symbol they can have on their tombstone. So um, I did at an early age. <laughs> that's why I am like I am today. You know? I like the idea that when you were 20 years old, you were thinking of what was going to go on your tombstone. It fits very well with your lyrical motifs. Uh <laughs> well, you know, you know, preparation is, is the mother of all inventions. <laughs> now, as you're sitting back in your your you're playing these shows and, and you're revisiting uh, your past at the same time as being in the present. Is there any particular song that you're finding is connecting with you more than it did perhaps back in the day in terms of its live performance? Like are you enjoying playing any particular song any more than the others? Um, well, for whatever reason, the, uh, Right Here in My Arms is one of the songs that seems to connect with the audience even more than it did with him. For, or it has i'm not sure i, I can't promise uh, to you that in advance how it's going to turn out over there but uh, um but it, it's funny also how what i find inter interesting is that where in the set you're placing a song how much that has an influence it's like uh, uh there's a song called heart full of ghosts this moody track from the neo noir album that the starts up quite quiet and, and and moody as a set and turns out to be very chaotic quite fast and noisy and sort of ugly so after that song join me in death is perfect so it's very important how the dynamic between the song how, how they play off of each other and, and how how that creates the tension release tension release sort of thing and and um so in that sense it's not necessarily so much about a single song it's about where those songs are and how how a song can make the next song shine Basically, I'm just saying that you play a shit song and then you play a decent one. <laughs> and sometimes you borrow a song from another artist and play that. As a as a man who has quite the iconic cover uh, of a Chris Isaac song uh, and a number of other uh, covers as well, uh, Neil Diamond, mm. uh, um, are you aware of that someone is likely at some point going to take one of your songs and make it their own. And will you be okay with that when it does happen? Uh, but of course, you know, music is there for, uh, as long as you credit me, I'm fine with it. You know, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it's a nice thing. And it's, it's, it's also it's something because I've been in the world of music all the time and sort of active more or less. Uh, it's funny how people have started using the words like legendary, you know, when talking about him. And uh, then some people who were never able to see the band back in the day, they were in their, you know, teens or whatever. 
they've been able to come over and, and check out, uh, hear the hymn songs play for the first time during the uh, BB tour. And it's, it's quite amazing. I, I, because I've been a part of it all the time, I, I can't see the, the time is very relative and it feels a bit different. So, um, but yeah, it's, um, I can't remember what the question was, but uh, it was more or less, to me. will you be okay with someone taking on your song the way oh, you yeah, take yeah. on others? Yep. Yeah, of course. Yeah, but that's what you're supposed to do. And then at the end of the day, most of the bands, um, like Black Sabbath, for example, and, and I think the Beatles as well, you know, bands started playing covers. That's how you find your own sound because at first, there's so many variables in a band. You get together and you get along and you got cut the same hair and, and, uh, and uh, trying to figure out what's unique about the identity of the sound of a band is, um, is easier said than done. And I think for us uh, as, as him, um, wiki, playing Wicked Game was super important because um, because it enabled me not to think about the song because I already knew that it's great. So we just wanted to make it, you know, give it justice and while giving it our own spin. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so we kind of, I owe a lot to, not only to Black Sabbath and, and Typo and all those bands, but uh, I owe a lot to Chris Isaac for, for uh, turning us into the monsters we are. Brilliant. Well, I do believe I have to let you go. But before I do, I must ask you one uh, question that everybody gets asked on this uh, particular site. And that is, if you could have any song play when you enter a room, as if you're a fighter or a wrestler or something, what song would it be? And why? If I was a fighter, I'm a lover, not a fighter. So yeah. the songs are quite different in that genre. But uh, if I would be a fighter entering a room, I would pick 333 by John Cage. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that track. It's uh, it's silence for three minutes and 33 seconds. There are different versions. I think 444 and 357 or whatever. But uh, I think just to make a point to be different and to cause a bit of a ruckus, I think it's very, very important when when uh, being in this weird, weird uh, world of music that I am to... Uh, to try to stand out, and especially if you're trying to stand out with silence. So that's, a, that's my philosophical ending and answer to that question. I love it. Well, Australia looks very forward to seeing you out and about uh, in our world, and I look forward to seeing you in Melbourne, which I will be doing. Uh, and yeah, thanks for taking the time to talk to me. I wasn't lying. I, I honestly was quite a big uh, hymn fan when I was a a youngin uh, and remain a fan of the work you're doing now. So uh, thanks for being kind enough to chat to me today. Thank you very much for having me. And then uh, don't forget to uh, knock on the dressing room door at the uh, Melbourne gate. It'd be nice to see, you know, meet up face to face. No worries. Sounds great, man. See ya. Laters.